<laughs> Welcome everyone to our Science at Home series. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening us, uh, listening to us. You know, try, try to figure out our technology a little bit. Um, and my name is Alicia Christensen. I am an Education and Outreach Associate with Series. Uh, and I'm going to introduce our speaker today and field any questions she has. So feel free um, if you look up, you should see a question and answer icon um, in your screen and feel free to put questions in there as we move throughout her program today or at the end of the talk. We'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end of the talk. Um, so today we have Dr. Uh, Alia Kashik, and she is a series postdoctor postdoctoral fellow uh, working on water carbon cycle interactions at NOAA. And um, specifically, she works with the global carbon observations and models at the Global Monitoring Laboratory uh, to understand how carbon fluxes are currently changing and will change in the future with climate change. So uh, she actually received her PhD in atmospheric sciences at CU and she also uh, has a master's degree in chemistry and oceanography and um, has a cert certificate in college teaching and she has also done a lot of outreach um, at local schools. So uh, she is excited to join you guys today and talk. So I will turn it over to Alia. Hi everyone. So I guess we're going to get started with uh, uh, Amanda showing you this um, the word cloud that we're assembling and I'm seeing answers already trickle in. Amanda, you want to lead this bit? Sure. So uh, anyone tuning in, if you go to menti.com in a separate browser, you can enter the code 33160322. And you can get your answers sent in for what comes to mind when you think of weather. And we're also going to ask you what comes to mind when you think of climate. So I'm going to move to our second slide because I see stuff coming in. You'll be able to still answer this question on what you think of when you think of weather. But I'm also going to ask, like I said, about climate. Uh, you can also uh, if you're unable to submit things to menti.com, like it says up at the top of the screen, you can write your answers in the Q&A as well. All right, thanks Amanda for sorting this out. So I, I just wanted to pose these two questions initially because when you hear people talk about forecasting things, you know, like what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? What's the climate going to be like next month? The two are linked in many ways. The climate is essentially an average of the weather over some statistical period of time, uh, typically decades. So 10, 20, 30 years are what we would consider a, a baseline for trying to average out weather to come up with what the climate statistics would look like. But you will find that a lot of the features that we're going to talk about today, especially in context of the Arctic, are things like temperature, which is, you know, on a day to day basis. That's the one thing that I look at to figure out what I'm going to put on first thing in the morning or what jacket I need to wear when I leave the house and things like that. So um, temperature is one of those really fundamental questions uh, when it comes to monitoring climate. Yep, and I see a lot of hotter summers and long term yep good seasons and cooler winters amanda is there a way to display these two side by side um good question i don't think i can until okay. we're, we're done but i can show it at the end of the presentation i think okay that's cool if you go if, um I'm just curious as to what the other answers were for weather, if there's more overlap, but I'm seeing a lot of temperature related um, things. We've got rain, sunshine, um, yeah, definitely a lot more. I see a lot more like weather phenomenon, things like tornadoes and clouds and rain and snow, which um, all will feed into climate ultimately as well. 
Cool. Well, I, I hope that this has got you guys thinking about, you know, what types of stuff we like to think about as climate scientists when we're trying to monitor what's going on on planet Earth. And I do love the fact that long term is popping up here because that is exactly what we do at the Global Monitoring Lab. We make long term observations and we record measurements from all over the planet and see how things like greenhouse gases are changing over time so that we can make the connection between what is happening in the atmosphere and what is going on with climate change. And so with that, I think maybe I'll just switch over to my slides. Amanda, is that fine? Yeah, that sounds great. OK, all in. All right, so I'm here to talk to you guys today about the changing Arctic carbon cycle. Um, and um, I'm going to just step through some of the key things that I think about when when thinking about how climate change is impacting the Arctic. Um, and of course, there's a lot more going on in the Arctic in terms of how this is impacting you know, stakeholders, um, plants, animals, um, communities. And I won't get into that uh, in huge amounts of detail in the presentation, but I'm certainly happy to um, take discussion points at the end. So the first thing I just want to talk about is, um, you know, we just talked about how temperature is one of the things that climate scientists look at. And this is the record of how temperature has changed in the last approximately 110 years, um, uh, ending in 2012, um, using one of the NASA models. So GIS is just one of the uh, models that are used to record this temperature. And um, a couple things I want to draw your eye to. You see brighter purple colors in the northern part of the northern hemisphere. And so that is indicative of the Arctic actually warming at a much faster rate than the average planet is warming. And the little black crosses that you see are just indicating that the the trends at all these places are significant. And so um, maybe the only place where the trend is maybe a little bit not necessarily significant is where you see the light blue right up in the North Atlantic. Um, but in most places over the world, and especially up in the Arctic, the planet is warming, and in the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the planet as an average. If you look at just the 1960 to 2019 record, you can see that the Arctic is warming almost four to five times as fast. The previous graph, if you guys see the scale goes up to about two and a half. If you're just looking at the last 50 years, the Arctic is actually warmed almost five times as fast. And this acceleration and warming of the Arctic is also evident when you're looking at the zonal mean averages. So if you're looking at you know, going from all the way from the South Pole to the North Pole, you can see, especially in the Arctic, the rate of the warming is a lot higher compared to the rest of the planet. So I just want to drive home this fact that um, not only has the Arctic been warming in the past, but you know if you look at projections out into the future based on the IPCC assessment report, and depending on you know which scenario we are in emissions of um, the RCP 2.6 or the business as usual RCP 8.5 scenario, the Arctic by the year 2100 is going to be significantly warmer than the rest of the planet and at a rate that's going to be much faster than the rest of the planet as well. Um, and so this um, is something that is not really disputed in the climate science community or by some of these models. So clearly you can see that um, the stippling indicates that there's a significant trend expected in most of these places and that the trend is going to be much higher in the far north. So at the Global Monitoring Lab, the one thing that we've been monitoring since the 1950s is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so you can see this increasing trend of carbon dioxide um, from about 1958 onwards. So initially the, uh, the measurements were done by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and thereafter continued by the NOAA GML, which is where I work. And you can see this pretty consistent increase in CO2 since the 1950s. And this is mostly because of humans emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. Now I've spent a lot of time talking to you guys about temperature and now I'm switching to talking to you about CO2. So I just wanted to show you this quick video that I really like to show on my intro Earth Science classes. Um, hmm. Okay. They're going to see this. I apologize for my slow walk. All right. So this is only 52 seconds, but it makes a nice link between greenhouse gases and temperature. So here we go. You may have heard of global climate change, which is often called global warming. We'll quickly summarize the mechanism of global climate change. Earth transforms sunlight's visible energy into infrared light, 
and infrared energy leaves Earth slowly because it's absorbed by greenhouse gases. As people produce more greenhouse gases, energy leaves Earth even more slowly, raising Earth's temperature even more than it has already gone up. Please share this video with others so you can help them understand how global warming works too. Okay, so hopefully you guys all saw that. It was pretty short, but it gives you a very succinct understanding of how increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is what we've been doing through anthropogenic or human emissions, um, eventually results in temperatures increasing all over the planet. Alicia, are there any questions coming in? Uh, we do not have any questions currently. Okay, um, if there are, please go ahead and stop me. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so greenhouse gases, um, at GML, we make a lot of observations of these all over the planet. And I just want to give you a few key processes by which these gases are exchanged in the atmosphere. So, for example, you can see that there is obviously uptake by plants. Um, and so photosynthesis is one of the main ways that CO2 is pulled out of the atmosphere by plants all over the planet. At the same time, those plants also respire. So just like we breathe in and out, plants breathe in and out. And so they breathe in CO2. Um, and then during the process of respiration, that CO2 is then sort of exhaled back into to the atmosphere. Um, you also have a lot of methane. Methane is a really key greenhouse gas, and I'll come back to it in context of the Arctic in a little bit. But um, methane is emitted by uh, anaerobic decomposition, whereas CO2 is emitted in the presence of uh, oxic decomposition or in the presence of oxygen. Um, one key important process is um, ocean exchange. And um, in this graph over here, what I'm trying to show you guys is the fact that um, a lot of the CO2 that gets emitted into the atmosphere is actually taken up by the land. And so that's this light green bar as well as by the ocean and this the dark green bar. And then the rest of it stays in the atmosphere. So it turns out that the ocean actually takes up about 25% of emitted fossil fuels. But as the oceans warm, the solubility of the CO2 that actually goes into physically dissolving in the oceans, um, CO2 is actually less soluble in warm water. And so as the oceans warm, as the planet warms, we're actually going to be able to, uh, the oceans are going to be able to absorb less CO2 going forward. So this is another important consequence of global warming in terms of the overall carbon budget. And what that's going to mean is that instead of the CO2 getting dissolved and removed by the ocean, it's going to remain in the atmosphere and lead to more warming, just as that video was telling us. So in the Arctic, there's a few different things. I just touched on photosynthesis and respiration. So if it gets warmer in the Arctic, then there is actually an opportunity for plants to extend their growing seasons. Um, and that's what this graph is showing here on the right hand side. So all the places where you see green are where they've actually added growing days per year because it's been warmer and the conditions have been more suitable for plant growth and photosynthesis. And so in some ways, this is a good thing because now we're trying to draw down more CO2 in, in the Arctic because of the, this extended greening period. However, having said that, the opposite of photosynthesis I just mentioned is respiration and typically in the summer that's when you see photosynthesis and CO2 being taken up but in the winter you get that CO2 coming back out through the process of respiration and there's a paper here that was published by a friend of mine that actually shows that over the last few decades the respiration has also been increasing over time so it's not just that the plants are growing more in the summer but they're also respiring more in the winter and so in in essence that kind of cuts off the positive effect of the plants actually taking up CO2 because they're just going to release it back. In addition, the fact that um, we have warming in the Arctic means that a lot of the soil layers that are typically frozen and what's known as permafrost actually melts. And when that melt takes place, then you get more microbial activity and that generates more carbon dioxide and methane through respiration as well. And so you have all these sort of competing factors going on in the Arctic. So it's, it's, it's really important to think about what's going on in terms of the carbon cycle in the Arctic, because a lot of people think that the release of methane from Arctic pools is actually going to be an important tipping point in the future for pushing our climate into possibly a, you know, a regime that we've never seen before. So this permafrost, this frozen ground that I was talking about, um, there's some pictures here that I pulled um, off of the good old internet, but some of them also from the NSIDC, where you can see the impacts of thawing permafrost. And so you can have these like chunks of land getting completely ripped out, and that exposes a lot of the underlying strata. Typically, this would remain frozen if it was locked off from the atmosphere, but now that it's exposed to the atmosphere, all of this is going to melt away and cause more warming. 
You also have forests and trees that you know are built then on unstable ground, and so they tend to um, get destroyed. And then this leads to the potential for disturbances and potentially wildfires and other insects. And it sort of leaves the tree populations more vu vulnerable to um, being destroyed. And then, of course, uh, I mentioned community stakeholders. People have built their homes on land in the Arctic, and a lot of those lands are now being thawed. The underlying permafrost is being thawed, and so structures in the Arctic are, are um, you know, potentially going to collapse as well. And so this is really important from a community standpoint to understand how this is going to change. Um, I really like this picture. Uh, this is from an a, a article by Ted Schur, who works in the Permafrost Carbon Network, and it just gives you an idea of like, OK, um, I showed you that picture of the, the CO2 uh, being released in the atmosphere earlier. This in the Arctic methane is also a super important component. Um, and then in terms of like the permafrost collapse that I was just talking about, one important aspect of this is that initially, you know, your ground level was up here because you had this solid frozen ground. As this is melting, you can see the subsidence going on, which was leading to what I just showed you with the structures and the buildings collapsing and the trees sort of getting a little wonky and all over the place. But if you end up with these pools of water, they essentially form what's called these thermocar ponds. And these ponds, because they're waterlogged, tend to do a lot more anaerobic decomposition. And I mentioned methane earlier. Well, this is primarily where methane gets sourced from is anaerobic decomposition in these waterlogged areas. And the graph over here on the right hand side is showing you the global <clears throat> methane measurements that we make at the Global Monitoring Lab. And those have also been increasing over time. Um, there's a little bit of a hiatus here and there's you know a lot of scientific research going on as to exactly what caused that. And you know, we have other markers that we look at to try to see what um, you know caused this shift over time. But in general, you can see that methane has been increasing over time. And folks are very worried about the Arctic, um, you know, causing a, 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 an Arctic methane release um, uh, being a, a problem in the future. Um, I mentioned methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, but it's actually way more powerful than CO2 on shorter timescales. It's it's almost 80 times as potent on a 20 year timescale. And so this release of methane in the Arctic is something that scientists are trying to trace and understand, um, you know, through observations, through modeling, through getting ground level measurements at as many of these types of sites as we can to try to understand what's going on. OK, so the final thing I want to talk about today is sea ice. Um, so you when I showed you those pictures of temperature in the Arctic um, and I told you that the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the planet, you may have some questions as to why. Well, it's connected a lot to what's going on with the sea ice. And this is a video I took from NASA. And what it's going to show you is the evolution of the sea ice minimum area over time starting in about 1975. So the background you can see the white is demonstrating the extent of the ice sheet and you and you know the ups and downs are essentially summer and winter so you've got more freezing in the winter and more melting in the summer. But in general if you if you, you just kind of train your eye to look at the edges you can see that the area is shrinking over time and the red line in the front is showing you that shrinkage. You're going from about 7 million square kilometers in 1980 down to a minimum of less than three square million kilometers in 2012, which was our minimum, um, our least minimum so far. Um, 2020 is uh, primed to be the second lowest sea ice record um, ever since the sea ice records have been held over the last 50 years. And so what happens with the sea ice is that, you know, you can see here again the extent of sea ice change from the uh, 1970s to the 2000s compared to the minimum that it was in 2012. Um, there's two aspects to this and I'll get into um, the first thing, which is that sea ice actually can remove CO2. It can actually freeze out CO2 from the atmosphere kind of in a similar way that the oceans dissolve CO2. But this is super interesting because this gets locked away in these really salty brine pools and then it, it just falls away from the surface of the ocean into the deeper ocean. So this is a, it could be a really effective way of removing CO2. And if we lose the sea ice, then that we lose that CO2 sink as well. And also, if you look at the IPCC projections of what the sea ice is going to do by the year 2050, if we follow our CP 8.5, we could be potentially sea ice free in the Arctic, which is not good. And the main reason it's not good is because of the second thing that I'm going to talk about, which is albedo. Um, and you can see, so albedo is essentially, um, you can think about it as brighter objects reflecting more sunlight. And so obviously this screen over here in 1979, more white equals more bright. And so you got more sunlight being reflected in the 1970s compared to the 2000s. And what that does is 
if you have warmer temperatures and you have more melting of sea ice as well as the snow on top of the permafrost that I mentioned, all of this melts and it exposes darker ocean and darker soils. These darker soils and oceans have lower albedo, so there's less sunlight reflected and more sunlight absorbed. And when you have more sunlight being absorbed, that leads to more snow and ice melting and more warming. And this is what we call a positive feedback loop, which is the reason why the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet because of the loss of um, ice covered areas. So that was a lot to throw at you guys in 10 minutes, um, but that's all I got. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at this point. OK, well, thank you so much, Alia. I, I love all this stuff. It's super interesting. <laughs> um, if you have questions, again, uh, you can go to the icon, the Q&A icon in your screen and um, put questions in. OK, so it looks like we have a question here. Um, how can we, from Natasha, um, how can we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air? Great question. And there are people on all different scales working on that. When I mean scales, I mean um, people personally trying to make an impact with their personal carbon footprint. So for example, a lot of people are eating less meat because producing meat um, in, in these farms is a big source of um, CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. But um, so those are very personal decisions. You could put solar panels in your house to try to switch to renewable energy. You could drive an electric car to try to save on gas. Those are very personal decisions, but uh, governments at the local level, state level, national and international level are all working on solutions. So there, um, there's a couple different, you know, um, big technologies out there for scrubbing CO2 from the atmosphere. There are people who are trying to use fans to literally pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and then tunnel it to places where it can then be used to grow plants. And so, you know, trying to make use of the excess CO2 to grow plants to help feed the planet. That's, I find that a really interesting technology. And then there's people who are working on dissolving it into these giant pools in the ocean and then burying it at the bottom of the ocean. There's all kinds of technologies out there for trying to reduce CO2. Unfortunately, a lot of these are unproven at large scales. And what we really need is large scale removal. So getting corporations and factories and companies to reduce their carbon emission footprint as an overall goal, I think is one that should be um, important for us. And a lot of companies in the US are now actually incorporating that as part of their balance sheet calculations. You know, If we go more green, that's obviously better for the environment, but maybe it's also better for our bottom line. And a lot of people are finding that switching their technologies to more green friendly technologies are actually going to help them save money in the long run. If you're saving less on like heating your buildings or powering your transportation fleet, then that's all a good thing. Plus, it's a good thing for the planet. So hopefully that gives you an idea. There's a lot going on. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Love that. So we have another question from uh, Iris. She asks, uh, is the atmosphere clearing up because the sky looks like it's getting clearer and I'm starting to see more stars? Wow, great question. I think this really depends on where you are. And I personally am in uh, Boulder right now where you may or may not know that there's giant wildfires raging all around us. And so I actually haven't seen stars for a while. But and if you live in California and you talk to somebody who's been there for the last few months, they probably haven't seen stars for several months because of all the raging fires going on over there. So I think this is very local. Um, and it's great that your community sounds like, you know, maybe they're doing the right things in terms of their air quality or one thing that, you know, I should point out is that a lot of the wildfire smoke that you are, you know, we're seeing currently locally and in California eventually does make its way all over the U.S. through, you know, atmospheric transportation pathways. And so I'm glad you live in an area that's clear, um, but I will say that in general, it seems like air quality as a whole is actually getting worse, especially recently because of a lot of these disturbance events. Um, and you're right, getting CO2 emissions in the atmosphere will impact air quality. And so if companies and corporations and governments all reduce their carbon dioxide emissions and methane emissions and, you know, uh, other, you know, especially things like NOx, um, sorry, nitric oxides and sulfur oxides, which are produced um, as a byproduct in, in transportation and other things. Those are typically what lead to like really bad air quality days as well. Ozone here in the front range is a huge air quality uh, threat and 
So a lot of these things will also improve as we start to control our emissions better as well. Mm -hmm. You touched on this briefly. Maybe could you talk about this a little bit more? Um, are the California and Colorado wildfires related to climate change or maybe how are they related to climate change? Great question. Yes, they are absolutely related to climate change. You can think about it in a couple of ways. Um, firstly, of course, if it's warmer, um, you can think about the atmosphere as being more of a sponge for water. And there is a very physical relationship and I won't get into what it is, but the warmer the atmosphere is, the more water it can hold. What that basically means is the warmer the atmosphere gets, the more evaporation occurs from the land surface and all that water that plants would otherwise normally use for growth and you know maintenance all goes into the atmosphere. And so you get drought conditions and you get plants drying out. And when you get wood and plants and um, trees and shrubs drying out, what does that lead to? More fuel for fire, right? And so that's one of the main reasons. Also, you know, having warmer temperatures as a whole means that if you have a small spark, you're more likely to ignite this fuel um, that you know has been caused by things drying out. So that's that's really like the main thing. There's there's more physical detailed descriptions of how things like vapor pressure deficit and other things feed into this, but that's the one that I tend to think of more. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what do you tell skeptics um, that you know think this is all a hoax and and think that scientists are are trying to drive politics? Oh boy, that is a great question. <laughs> and I have like a four hour long answer version. Um, no, I'll, I'll keep it short. I would say, look at the scientific data that's been collected. Um, I, I don't have a slide here now, but if you look at the CO2 historic record going back to millions of years ago, which we can do because we have measured CO2 in ice cores and through other paleoclimate proxy data, and it shows us that, you know, the last time that the CO2 was even near the level that we were at was many, many, many thousands of millions of years ago at a point where life was not sustainable on this planet. And the kind of rate of increase of CO2, it's, I really should have included that graph and I'm really sorry I didn't. But if you look at this, this graph of, um, you know, CO, uh, CO2 increase over time, if you stretch this back to the paleoclimate record, it is really like, Tick, 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 and then it jumps up giant at the end. And that's where we're at. We're in this rate of increase, which is completely unprecedented and hasn't been seen. And I mentioned one positive feedback with the sea ice, but there are several other climate feedbacks that could potentially cause tipping points leading to, you know, loss of biodiversity, more wildfires, more climate change related extreme events. And all of this costs a lot of money too. I mean, one thing we didn't touch on is in the wildfire, it costs a lot of money to rebuild or relocate communities or even just to deal with the fallout of having to, uh, you know, if you're on evacuation, where are you going to go live? There's a lot of things on a very personal level and, you know, a, an economic level that are connected to climate change. And we have absolutely no idea how much this is going to end up costing us if we don't do something about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, yeah, you're talking about impacts. There's a couple questions kind of about the impact. So um, I, I guess, you know, can you expand a little bit more about the the various ways that climate change can affect us in the and the world? And also, like, how does it affect the um, ocean, the animals that are in the ocean? Okay, great question. I did not, I'm going to start with the ocean thing first because there's one thing I wanted to mention that is ocean acidification. I mentioned CO2 dissolves in the ocean and um, the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the more CO2 goes into the ocean just because of physics. And that is actually causing a decrease in the pH in the ocean, which is making it more acidic, which is make it essentially toxic for life forms in the ocean. So we've seen a lot of loss of fishes and just generally biodiversity in the ocean from them not being able to keep up with the stresses of a warmer temperatures but then also more acidic climates and you've probably seen pictures of coral reefs getting bleached in the last um, several decades a lot of that is related to climate change and warmer temperatures and so there's a lot of very visible impacts of climate change all over the world um, i would say you know things like wildfires and the increasing the severity and the extent of wildfires something that in the u.s especially recently is something we've reckoned with more floods because of sea level rise. If you live in a coastal community, then your water level has been going up over time. And so a rainstorm that maybe would have only caused a little bit of puddling, you know, decades ago is now actually causing 
multiple feet of, of, of feet of flooding in communities. And so then that's a whole different problem of you know relocating and, and costs and, and so forth. So I think in the US there is a lot of very visible climate change effects depending on where you live. Uh, even things in Colorado like the pine bark beetle infestation. A lot of the stresses on the trees from warmer temperatures, it means that they are less able to deal with other stresses like insect breakouts and things. And even even those insects are not moving um, they're, you know, geographically, they may have been restricted to one certain area because that climate was good for them. Now with warmer temperatures spreading all over the place, a lot of these insects are also now spreading to places they weren't previously found. And so that's impacting biodiversity in forest areas. OK, uh, great. Thank you. Um, we have tons of questions coming in, so I'm trying to trying to get to them all. Um, and I, I should mention I'm happy to answer stuff over email. I know it looks like we're going to run okay. over time, but I'd be happy to answer these questions in more detail over email and maybe provide things like references and citations, which I don't have off the top of my head right now. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, could you talk a little bit about like how do, how do we know um, that the greenhouse gases are increasing um, and and then also how long do the greenhouse gases last in the atmosphere? Great questions. So there's um, a, a couple of different things. I'll, I'll enter the second thing first. Um, CO2 can persist in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Um, methane, uh, slightly shorter than that on the order of 20 to 40 years, but it depends on you know the, the source of the methane and how much is being emitted and you know what the, the air patterns are doing because eventually even if you emit CO2, for example, at a factory, let's say somewhere in the Midwest, it's going to get distributed into the entire atmosphere and make its way around the entire planet, which is why so you, I'm showing you this graph that is taken at Mauna Loa, but you can see similar trends at multiple sites across the planet. And we do measurements in 67 countries around the world where we see these signals over time. And so um, we are, and that comes back to the first portion is we make these measurements really carefully. We have extremely strict laboratory protocols as to what our you know, uncertainties are in these measurements. And this increase over time, as I mentioned, 400 parts per million is something that we have not seen in the paleo climate record for a very long time. And so part of it is that we are making these measurements over time and th these emissions are directly correlated with things that industries report in terms of their outgoing carbon emissions. You can imagine a, a giant factory has a you know, big smokestack they're actually required by law to figure out, you know, how much smoke essentially they're emitting. And so if you tally up all those emissions from the ground level industries, then that actually correlates really well with this increase in CO2 over time. But the second thing I will say, and I'm, I'm not going to have time to delve into it in too much detail, but I can explain this over email later on if people are interested. There is an isotopic signature. So there's a secondary signature associated with these fossil fuels that is very distinctive. I mean, and it has to do with the fact that the carbon in CO2 has three isotopes, right? So you've got carbon-12, which is the predominant one on planet Earth, like 99 point something percent. Then you've got carbon-13 and carbon-14. Carbon-14 is the one isotopic tracer that people can use really efficiently to look at what the source signature of the CO2 is. And really simply what that what the reason why that is is because all of the CO2 that's being emitted into the atmosphere right now is from carbon that was buried millions and millions of years ago, essentially dead plants and animals that are being dug up. And uh, that's why they're called fossil fuels. It's, it, the fossil part is dead plants and animals, right? And so the, they were buried millions and millions of years ago and their carbon-14 levels in that decayed plant and animal organic matter is super low. And so when that gets emitted into the atmosphere, it has a very distinctive carbon-14 signature that we can then use to say, all right, the source emissions therefore have to be this versus like a plant or an animal or something else. Because a live plant and animal has much more carbon-14 because we're in equilibrium with the current carbon-14 in the atmosphere, whereas anything that's been buried and removed from contact with the atmosphere has virtually no carbon-14 at this point. And I hope that wasn't okay. too complicated. Yeah, and then um, can you also talk about how long it takes for the, uh, the the question is how long does it take for the atmosphere to get rid of the greenhouse gases um, till it decreases, um, till, you know, till we start to see a decrease in global warming, basically. So a lot of that is going to depend on what we end up doing. 
Um, so the IPCC report, which um, the latest one is from a few years ago now, but they update their you know, graphs on, on a fairly regular basis. Depending on what emission scenario we choose to follow, whether we go all out for mitigation techniques and try to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere in some of the ways that I mentioned previously, or if we do nothing and we just let CO2 increase, then a lot of these impacts are still going to persist over time until we get to a point where our emissions are declining. As our emissions start to decline, there's still going to be a bit of a lag with the temperature because everything that we've already emitted into the atmosphere, we've already kind of baked in an additional couple degrees of warming, regardless of what we do, at least another degree or two degree and a half of warming. And so the sooner we start to mitigate, the faster we're going to see a decline in temperature at a later stage over time. So it really depends what we choose to do over the next few decades. Okay, thank you. Well, one final question for you, um, and then if you guys have additional questions, feel free to email Alia. I put her email in the Q&A, so you can uh, copy that and email her, but um, a lot of questions just about, you know, what are the top three things that we can do to um, help uh, combat climate change? Um, what are things that you think will encourage people to help the world? Um, can one person make a difference? Yes, absolutely. And the most powerful way currently in the U.S. to make a difference is to go and vote. Speaking as somebody who is a guest in the U.S., I'm, I'm a foreign visitor and I cannot vote. I feel a little helpless at times, so I do personal things like I try to drive a hybrid or we put solar panels in our house and you know, we're trying to do things like that. We're trying to cut out meat in our diet and switch to more plant-based diet. It's little things like that, you know, walk, uh, bike instead of driving if you can. Um, but on to make a difference on a larger scale, you really need to convince people who are making policy that this is important. And why is it important? Because it's affecting you, it's affecting your community, it's affecting the health of people on this planet. And I feel like that is a value that we can all get behind. You know, it's not I'm not doing this because it's going it's going to make me a million dollars, for example. It's going to make the health of my neighbors better. It's going to have less climate change impacts of people who live in coastal regions and who are uh, potentially in these really dangerous wildfire zones. And I feel like sometimes um, politicians get swayed by what they think, you know, the, the industry aspect and what, you know, whether or not they get funding directly from fossil fuel agencies is a separate issue, but I feel like they should still care about the health and well-being of their citizens. And if you can convince them of that, um, and you know, just the fact that even switching to green technologies is an economic incentive, like people can actually make money by becoming more green. And if I think if you could convince the people in charge of that, then they would be more likely to try to take the right policy decisions. But Number one right now, if you can or if you know people who can, convince them to go vote and vote for the right people who will actually do something about what's happening with climate change. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. That was uh, super interesting. And thank you so much for answering uh, all of our questions. Um, and I just want to uh, briefly talk about the presenter next week, uh, Julio Sepulveda. Um, he studies the relationship between microorganisms and climate in continental margins, uh, terrestrial ecosystems, and extreme environments. And uh, he also studies paleo or historical ecosystems during like major climatic biotic transitions like mass extinction events, glacial, interglacial transitions and, and uh, greenhouse climate. So please join us next week at the same time for that talk. Also, if you're interested in exploring more about what Alia talked about today, let me share my screen here. Um, on our website, you can uh, find that with the page associated with uh, Alia's talk today, you can find a bunch of activities that uh, students that you guys can do from home. And uh, you'll find that we have a bunch of resources actually on a network called Clean. Clean and there's over 700 actually peer-reviewed lesson plans on that website. A lot of them uh, touch on the carbon cycle and even the Arctic uh, carbon cycle. And uh, one of the things Alia talked a lot about today was the permafrost too, permafrost too. So I just wanted to um, point this activity out, modeling the influence of sunlight on the release of uh, CO2 from thawing permafrost.
Okay, so a lot of fun visualizations and things that you guys can uh, do from home as you are learning from home. And with that, uh, we will be ending our talk today. Again, thank you so much, Alia, for your time and uh, joining us. And we hope that the rest of you have a wonderful day today. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And, and seriously, everybody feel free to get in touch over email if you have follow-up questions.